for taking the time to um, talk with me and sit down for quarantined historians drinking coffee. Okay. Um, um, I picked I a mug, a Disney mug. Um, this one is from the Wilderness Lodge at okay. Disney. Um, I know that I picked it specifically for you because uh -huh. um, it says, I'm a glamper, not a camper. <laughs> nice. And I know that you are a camper and very outdoorsy, so I thought this was now, we're, we're getting more towards the glamper side than the camper side. But I, I fully understand. It, yeah, it depends on where you fall in the spectrum. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So anyway, I've got my uh, souvenir cowboy boot from uh, uh, Dallas, Texas area that my wife brought me back when they went. Well, it's from it's from Fort Worth Stockyards. Nice. Yeah. So I'm very interested to hear all your stories because you were at Vance a very long time. Yes, I was. It seemed like a long time at the time, but now when I think back on it, it's like, wow, that, that went by fairly quickly. It was uh, 29 years and some odd months, give or take. I uh, started in May of 1983, graduated from Western on the 15th, started at the site on the 16th. What? Which was, it, it's kind of cool as I, uh, when we had a graduation at Western, it was still in the football stadium, so it was outdoors. Mm -hmm. And Governor Hunt at that time was our uh, uh, speaker. And he flew in in the state helicopter and we got to see him land. He came up and did his speech and then he helped hand out the diplomas. And so I uh, had that kind of feeling when I was going across stage, I wanted to say, hey, thanks for hiring me. But because I was going to work the very next day for the state. And I was yeah. there until April 31st, 2012, which is coming up on eight years ago, which is kind of crazy. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So you got to see a lot of change probably at the site, uh, right? Quite a bit. A lot of very, very small incremental changes. You know, in hindsight, what has occurred at the site since then to present uh, is, is amazing. The changes that I'm seeing on social media and stuff that you're doing. And when I've been to the site and uh, attended some of the programming, it's like, wow, they've taken uh, what was taking 30 years to move and doing it in three or four years, which is very cool. Yeah, we, um, well, we've been able to take, you know, what people, y'all have worked on previous staff and um, kind of run with it. A lot of the research, you know, that was done around, um, the enslaved people and all of that. We've been able to to take that, you know, groundwork and um, kind of run with it. So yeah. it's been that is been interesting. Fantastic. I know in '83, really up through the '80s, I guess maybe '88, '89, when uh, uh, Mountain Masters came out, uh, uh, that was like the pivotal moment as far as starting to look more at slavery in Western North Carolina. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to that, typically, you know, we had the slave cabin there at the site, which was an amazing kind of thing, considering that the site was developed in the late 50s, early 60s, that they had the foresight to locate a potential slave cabin, bring it to the site and put it there. Right. So we had that object there that we were talking about, but other than that, slavery in West North Carolina was almost non-existent in the interpretive uh, vein of things throughout the area. Right. A lot of people, um, I think, assume that slavery didn't exist in the mountains. Exactly. Um, that's the question that I get a lot of. And I, I think, um, you know, because there is this, we associate slavery with um, really large grand plantations in Charleston. We're picturing these, you know, giant plantation homes. Yes. Um, I think people struggle sometimes um, with picturing it any other way. When you were there, you started at Vance as the site manager or did you start a different position? It's the position that Dennis is in now, which I think is site 
Site assistant, not site assistant. It was site assistant, and it just yes. changed to now he's like a maintenance mechanic maintenance one mechanic or something. Mechanic. And okay. I, okay. I always find those definitions really don't yeah. do yeah. justice to the job. Yeah, you but know. basically, uh, got a four year degree so that I could go and mow yards, <laughs> <laughs> which was, you know, in, in 83, that was an awesome opportunity because yeah. the, uh, 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 economy at that time was tanking. Uh, you know, interest rates were like 10 to 20 percent. Unemployment was pretty high. And also, I was more focused in natural resource uh, management for recreation mm -hmm. purposes. Uh, right. That was kind of my dream job. I was looking at going to the uh, National Forest Service, and yeah, I've so always cool. have had an interest, particularly in local history and kind of folklorish kind of stuff. And so, uh, and I had done an internship at the Mountain Heritage Center, so I had a, a few fillers out in the local history area, and found out about the job at Vance. And I, no matter your job title, you get to do it all. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, that's what one of my favorite things is to watch people when Dennis is mowing the lawn. Uh -huh. And then um, a tour comes, or there's a school group, and he hops off the mower and then starts giving a school program. Yes. And people are like, what, what just happened? <laughs> exactly. And Sudi was uh, promoted up to the position that the first site manager was holding at that time, Bob Conway. He was the regional education specialist for historic sites. And he was based out of the Western office. I can see you just thinking, oh, man, wouldn't it be nice to have something like that now? I'm like, ooh, <laughs> that sounds yeah. like a fun job. Yes. He <laughs> primarily did school programming. And then when Sudi moved into the position, she started focusing more on assisting the Western regional sites in interpretive programming. So yeah. Bob was the site manager at Vance. He was the first site manager, Robert Conway. And then he moved into that education position? Yes. And then she moved Indeed. into site manager? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's so roughly two years that I wasn't manager. And then from that time until retirement, I kind of hung in there. And my interview for the position was kind of interesting. I went to Raleigh. We were doing the uh, North Carolina History Bowl. And so I did my interview the same time I was down there helping with that. And Ricky Howe, who was the uh, his operations manager, I guess, of, of all the, that time, maybe 22 historic sites. So he interviewed me, and at the end, he kind of looked at me. He was a uh, Johnson County uh, native, and so he had that kind of southeastern accent. He kind of looked at me and said, well, partner, you're set. Said, okay. Okay. <laughs> Typically, through the... 80s into the early 90s we were turning maybe 3300 kids a year 3300 through the wow. site and uh so we needed all the help we could get yeah yeah, yeah. that's changed a little bit <laughs> yeah i imagine um, it had changed a lot during my last 10 years there and we don't have any help during the week unless volunteers mm -hmm. uh, for school groups so typically it limits the number of kids we can accommodate Yes, yeah, um, so just because there's only three of us. And yeah. the further west you are as a historic site, the lower the priority can be as far as, you know, raising the alarm and right. saying, hey, I need help and I need it right now. And it's, yeah. it's not well, nearly as, as instantaneous as it is if you're in Durham. Of course, yeah. yeah. I um, <clears throat> worked at Historic Stagville in Durham uh, for three and a half years. And um, I think it's simply just distance. I mean, yes. Vance is four hours from Raleigh. Yes. So the needs are different. Um, that's one thing that, that I have found um, from it's, site to site. But. And it, it's hard to explain mm -hmm. until you've experienced it. It really is. You know, 29 years there, it was some hard, you know, kind of not a hard push, but it was difficult sometimes to make those moves without... Interpretively, you mean? Interpretively, yes. And also, you know, management-wise, uh, when I first started working, 
Sudi had set the standard that when anybody walked in the door, they got a tour. Wasn't on the hour, wasn't on the half hour. If you had two people come in, they got a tour. Gotcha. And three people came in five minutes later, they got a tour. <laughs> but we did have enough resources that right. we could manage that. You know, we mm -hmm. had generally three or four people at the site. And mm -hmm. um, then during the summertime, we had uh, uh, the CETA high school kids that would come in and we would train them. And we'd usually have two or three of them during the summer. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we had, and so that worked, but as those resources dwindled, yeah. trying to say all of a sudden, okay, we're just going to do tours at the top of the hour. Uh, it's amazing how much pushback you can get on something like that. Oh yeah. And did so, you have to make, did you make that change? Did you set yes. it to the time? Yes. We set it to, to on the hour and then we set it to where it would only be of the house itself and all of the grounds would be self-guided. Uh, mm -hmm. Prior to that, when a tour guide went out, you went around to all the buildings. Right. And, you know, you all but went and had deviled eggs with a picnic. <laughs> I mean, you, you spent a lot of time with them. <laughs> You're <laughs> like, now what's for lunch? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But, uh, uh, so, you know, just those little changes were kind of, uh, you'd be amazed how much pushback you'd get on it. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, you know, when people work well, I'm I'm sure you you've experienced that last couple of years as well. But. Mm. Mine, um, yeah, we have definitely had pushback more on um, like the the content that we're covering, yes. uh, how we're interpreting. Yeah. Um, we actually we changed it uh, recently. Well, in the last two years. Um, back to where our tour goes out a couple times a day mm -hmm. and it starts at the slave dwelling and mm -hmm. works its way through the buildings and finishes at the house. And the, the topic is really the same. We're talking about life on an early 1800s, late 1700s you know, farm, what plantations, how, you know, Western North Carolina's farms or plantations are, are different than or similar to what we typically think of. And you know how people lived. What did they do? What work did they do? Yeah. And um, you know what were the enslaved people doing? And what were their names? And um, you know what happened when the advances with the Buncombe Turnpike and that kind of thing. Yes. Um, so I feel like we're covering all of the same content. It's just the perspective is a little bit different because um, we're doing it from the perspective more of um, the enslaved people. Mm -hmm. So um, I think you know. It's interesting the the pushback that you'll get from the community on interpretive choices. Um, exactly. So, exactly. I, you know, who says history doesn't matter? <laughs> when you when you start changing up and trying to bring in more factual and different perspectives, then yeah, people yeah. suddenly. Pay attention, <laughs> which is yeah. a good thing. You know, it may not be comfortable, but it's good. Yeah. What are some of the like most interesting interactions you can remember with the public? Like, do you have any weird questions people have asked oh, you? <laughs> gosh, this is a good story, and I won't name any names. But it, was, it involved staff members, and it involved the fact that we had a uh, extension telephone up in the under the steps in the main house in the little cubby oh, yeah. closet there. Yeah. yeah, you probably have seen there's like a little shelf in there. That's where yep. the phone would sit. Well, we had a had a, an extension phone there and it was wired in. Uh, so if you picked up the phone down, down in the uh, visitor center, if the phone up there was off the hook, you would hear it. It'd be live. And <laughs> one morning uh, when, when some folks were up there cleaning, um, I was down in the visitor center and another person that's working there is the site assistant at that time. He had quite a uh, uh, mischievous uh, uh, sense of humor and it wasn't Chris. <laughs> Just to get that out there. I know I'm uh, like hmm. yeah yeah so anyway I was back in the office doing something and I heard him he picked up the phone he was going to call someone and he heard that the line was open. He's sitting there and he's looking at it 
And then he started going pss, 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 like that. I'm like, what is he doing? And he, pss, pss, and he said, listen, listen. And you could hear one of the ladies up there saying, there's something in that closet. What's in there? And, so, and he goes, pss, 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 like that. And then they opened it up and you could hear, you know, the, the door kind of creaking open and somebody poking in there at the broom. I think it's a bat. Is it a bat? And then she saw that the phone was off and she said, Gordon, is that you? <laughs> so I, I've named one person. Back when we were doing tours on demand, it was always comical and somewhat frustrating to see people pull in at quarter till five <laughs> and run out of their vehicles to get to the tour guide. So that, because at that time, Sudi expected, hey, if, you know, if you're still giving a tour at five o'clock, you're going to finish that tour. Ooh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and you're not going to get paid for it either. Well, that's why I'm like, we don't make enough money. <laughs> no, 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 we don't make enough money. For that. To be there until six o'clock on a Friday. <laughs> yes, yes. And, you know, it was really hard on the part-time people because she lived next door. Right. Yeah, yeah. and so, you know, she could monitor it monitor them and see when she was sight down. Oh yeah. That's yeah. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when she was manager, we were on a party line and the party line was with her husband's well with their house. Mm -hmm. So you know if somebody from Raleigh would call up, both phones would ring. <laughs> and you wouldn't have to listen to see, you know, one phone would have like a two fast rings, another one would have two slow rings, know which li which line they was calling. And Sudi's mother-in-law was still living with them at that time. And oh, so man. she would pick up sometimes. Uh, and so Sudi would be, you know, she'd, she'd answer the phone. It'd be somebody from Raleigh and Ms. Willer would pick up and she'd say, huh, huh. Okay. <laughs> Bob Conway started what he called and what we refer to as spring pioneer days mm -hmm. uh, in like 1968. At one time, it was the longest running continuous event that historic sites offered. It was always wow. like around 3rd of April, you know, kind of springtime and we would yeah. have a Sunday afternoon where people would do open hearth cooking, woodworking, mm -hmm. just different farm skills types of crafts. And right. we had the Make fall them. militia encampment and mm -hmm. it was also is a two-day pioneer day mm -hmm. militia encampment and it started out as a fairly big event. Uh, this was, you know, early 80s, not too long after the bicentennial, relatively speaking, and so there were a lot of Rev War reenactors out there looking for somewhere to do stuff. Yeah. So the site opened up for that, even though we were not a site for Revolutionary War activity. And right. the first year that I worked was the year before historic sites got any kind of handle on historic weapons. On cool. Site. And so it was literally like the wild, wild west. <laughs> they were, we, we had three battle scenarios at a place where no battle occurred. <laughs> and one, the British one, one, the blue coats or the continental line one, and then wow. one, the militia one. And yeah, that was nerve wracking for, and so the very next year, uh, we started doing weapons training. Mm -hmm. One of the first things they said, okay, we're going to rope off where the visitors are going to be. Makes sense. Uh, yeah. So we did that and we had, I mean, it would draw five, six hundred people that afternoon. What? Yes. Yes. It was crazy. <sighs> yeah. Don't, don't feel too bad. It, I was like, <laughs> And I had one guy, I was in charge of keeping people behind the ropes. And so <laughs> this one guy that he was determined to get in the middle of the battle. They, the Continental Line had lined up there at the, at the loom house and the um, British were coming across from the slave cabin. They came and they crossed them. And so, you know, they were, they were trading volleys and stuff. And so he kept wanting to get right in between them with his camera and taking pictures. And I kept of course. off. And finally he told me, he said, I'm a Marine. I'm a former Marine. Um, I can get as close to these weapons as I want to. I said, no, you can't. I said, if you do this again, I'm going to go out there and just stop it. You know? Well, had, you know, the thing was, I was told, keep them behind the rope, but I didn't, right. I wasn't told what was the consequences if somebody didn't. Right. 
And so I just came up with that kind of off the top of my head. I said, anyway, we'll just shut this thing down. <laughs> shut I, it down. Yeah. If you don't behave. And oh, so then the next year we got involved with the National Park Service training us. And now, you know, North Carolina Historic Sites had access to trainer for the Southeast on historical weapon stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I had to go through it. Yeah. <laughs> I did that training. Um, all the staff did it. Because of that, we started tightening up down on the interpretation. Suddenly we're saying, you know, we don't need to have British soldiers here. We don't need to have, we need to talk about, you know, the militia. Maybe, right. you know, and not even talk about the Revolutionary War. You know, maybe, so, you know I've been to the Christmas program and I've kind of lurked around for uh, the fall militia encampment. But, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the Christmas program is really different. It changes every year. We uh, change it a, li yeah. a little bit. We didn't, we didn't make it out this year. Yeah. I put it this coming year. It seems like I can't remember what was going on. Well, and it rained on us this year. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, so, yeah, the yeah. first year it was disjointed enough to me that it was like I left and literally took me like two or three days to figure it out. To process it. The process, yeah. 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 yeah, we and, um, as I told Marsha as we went away, I said, you know, to be such a bubbly personality, Kimberly has got a dark soul somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> to, have, <laughs> to have taken to have taken what was, you know, a Christmas Christmas program and made it into that that Yeah, I <laughs> That the Christmas program is definitely, um, it is not, I mean, it's based on a Christmas carol. Oh, Christmas carol. Yeah. It, yeah, it, I, yeah. It's not I, bubbly. The second year, I understood it much. <laughs> and, well, uh, but yeah, that first year, I did, you know, I got it, but it was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will say that. <laughs> It, um, it's changed every year. And part of it, you know, the first year, we used a lot of metaphor. And yeah. I think I was really um, honestly nervous because it was really the first time that we were doing a program that focused solely on an enslaved woman yes. at the site. And so I think both Aaron with the American Miss Center and myself were really nervous about the pushback from the community. And so we used a lot of metaphor rather than like putting it in your face. You know, we were talking about a slave auction and we're talking about yeah. reconstruction and we're talking about all of these really heavy concepts um, and using a, a lot of metaphor um, and people were missing it. Like the weren't picking necessarily picking up on the metaphors or they were doing it days later which is fine yeah, the yeah, yeah. point of the program is to spark conversation and thought mm -hmm. around these things um but then you know the feedback which was great we sent out surveys and people gave us feedback so we were we tweaked it again the next year mm -hmm. and even then um we kept some of the metaphors in there and people were still kind of struggling a little bit, missing some points. And so this last year, this third year um, was when it's, it's really, it, it cannot be more clear. We've put it in the program, what we're talking about, We've literally laid out the scenes. Um, you know, there's a lot more transitions that happen. Um, so I'm really happy with where it is now. I feel like this last year was, we finally got it where we want it. I, I, the more we have been clear about what the program is, honestly, the varied reactions. I either get people who really love it and yeah. are touched by it and sometimes cry or come back into the visitor center and say, oh my God, like that was so amazing. Or I have people who get really mad. <laughs> um, you know, we've had people who say like, I'm not gonna step foot in the slave dwelling. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Um, you know, in the first year that we did it, um, when it got snowed out and we did it in January, mm -hmm. the first night that it was supposed to happen, December 8th of 
2017? Yes. Um, was when the site was vandalized. I remember. So someone spray painted the, the yeah. side of the house. Um, so I feel like, uh, you know, that was a tough time, but um, it, it's very telling that that happened on the night that we were supposed to be doing, you know, a program completely around an enslaved woman uh, at the site. So. One of the things that was enjoyable back in those in the 80s was that there was no competition. Right. Yeah. You could do just about anything and bring in a crowd, but now not so yeah. much. Yeah. Yeah. We have to work really hard. Our our biggest event still is the folk festival, which is basically a pioneer day. Um mm -hmm. we just call it something different. Yeah. Um but it um you know we'll bring in we had a rain, it's rained almost yeah. every year on us on that event. It's in October and um, we I think the most we've had is like 450, maybe close to 500 if the weather's nice. No matter where you ventured in late 18th, all of 19th century history related to the South or to North Carolina in particular, or even West North Carolina, there was a tie to that farm and to that family, you know, oh, yeah. you can really, and there were times when I would look at something like, a, you know, Alamance Battleground or Bentonville mm -hmm. Battleground, they had like a one, you know, two hour event focus or a three day battle focus that was their primary mission. Mm -hmm. And we could, you know, we could go anywhere and yep. do anything but we couldn't really, you know, there really was, you know, the focus was the advance, but still, even, even focusing on the advance, you had his whole career. Mm -hmm. And it's like, wow, you know, it's, it, a lot of times it was frustrating because you didn't have a much more narrower focus to look at. Because yeah. you start, you know, if you start narrowing in on one little thing, which is you know, then you start picking at that, then all these other threads start pulling towards you and you say, oh, well, here's why this happened and, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's exciting and it's, it's an important thing for West North Carolina, I think, for people to yeah. realize how yeah. tied into everything that family was. Yeah, sometimes I feel like... Um the name of the site is almost misleading uh, yes. because it's the Governor Zebulon B. Vance Birthplace State Historic Site. And I'm like, but it's so much more than that. Um, yeah. Like he was born there, sure. And we have an entire exhibit that covers him. But our tour covers, I mean, it's basically a story of, you know, what we're covering all a lot of Western North Carolina history yes. we're, you know we're talking about how wealthy people lived how your average people lived um, enslaved people um, the different jobs that were happening you know agriculture um, and how the economy uh, changed economy yeah. changing yeah. politics I mean it yeah. is extensive what it we is. cover um, it is. so you're right I mean it is um, I almost I've, I've kind of over the last few years been wondering, I'm like, should, I wonder if we could actually change the name of the site. And if we did, yeah. what would we change it to? Yeah, yeah, I, I often felt like that the name itself lent itself to people having, you know, an expectation that really wasn't what the site could offer. Right. Or one of my favorite questions that I have ever gotten at the site uh -huh. is when um, someone called the site and they thought that it was actually a birthing center. I've got a story for that one. <laughs> They're like, so do I have to like bring my own midwife? <laughs> I was like, like BYOB, but like for a midwife? <laughs> yeah. That's <laughs> like, funny. This isn't like a, <laughs> a party. Like, I, and then I started thinking, I was like, hmm, revenue generator, maybe we advertise, like you sign a waiver, but you uh -huh. can come give birth. At the <laughs> That's right. That's right. Just, just so what's your story? Life. When we were doing the history ball, 
I was meeting with an eighth grade teacher at Asheville Middle School one day. And so I went to the school and, you know, checked in at the office. They told me where her room was. And so I went to the room and uh, she was finishing up something. So I was waiting out in the hall and this little girl came by, like a sixth grader. And she looked up at me and she said, why are you here? And I said, <laughs> I'm here to meet Miss So-and-so. And she said, well, where are you from? And I said, I'm from Dance Birthplace. And she put her hand over her mouth like this and she turned around and said, oh, Miss So-and-so's pregnant. <laughs> so anyway, didn't, you know, there was never any jobs anywhere else in North Carolina that was enticing enough to make me want to leave. Yeah. So, now, are you originally from Western North Carolina? No, I'm from near uh, Mebbin. Oh. Uh, yeah, yeah. I Northern didn't know that. Piedmont. Northern Piedmont. Um, my family's been there for uh, six generations. Mm. Uh, Strayhorn, Tates are pretty much uh, embedded in that area of Orange County. My brother is six generation farming the land that he's farming right now. So. Wow. <clears throat> so That's cool. I, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so uh, I retired. It was primarily the whole issue with um, the downturn of the economy and how public servants were beginning to be viewed as the villains instead of victims like everybody else. And mm. uh, it's like, you know now might be a good time to get out and also dealing with uh the possibility of the site closing mm. and seeing how other departments were handling some of their people that were close to retirement and um, rather than rather than riffing them they were giving them the option of taking a position like in goldsboro mm -hmm. somewhere like that and so making people have to make seriously disruptive choices yeah to either keep their job or, and so I, I started working on it about, I guess, 2000, 2011 or so. Um, What's like the most rewarding part of working at Vance? <laughs> uh, working with the general public hmm. and sharing the history of the area with people that were not, well, even people that were somewhat aware of it. You know, when we would get some of the volunteers, some of the reenactors that were just so engraved in certain parts of history and just hearing their perspective mm -hmm. on it was always interesting. And, uh, but yeah, just working with people. And the fact that at least for most of the career you were able to um, do several different things in a day. You know, mm -hmm. you could go out and you could work in the yard, you could do tours, you could do office work. There was no set structure that when you come in at eight o'clock in the morning, other than opening the buildings and closing the buildings, the rest of it was pretty much an unknown. Yeah. They kind of unfolded it as it would unfold and you would deal with it as you could. And that, that made it interesting. Mm -hmm. And you can, as you probably know, you come in on the day and you say, okay, this is going to be a slow day. I'm yeah. going to sit down and focus on this project and really knock out some research or some work or something. And mm -hmm. as soon as you get that in your mind, yep. it all just flies apart. Yep. Getting to interact with the uh, specialists on different things. When you talk about cleaning artifacts, we had a uh, Spencer, I can't think of his last name right now. He was a, a conservator worked specifically with historic sites for a number of years and then he I think he transitioned museum history as that position got cut from historic sites but you know I would call him about a problem and just go down this rabbit hole of mm -hmm. all kinds of techniques that you could use on an artifact and it's mm -hmm. like this is this is pretty cool to be burning this. Mm -hmm floating around maybe in your desk or there's probably a, a Polaroid picture of me on top of the roof of the kitchen. 
yep. leaf blower blowing the sawdust off of because nobody else wants to get up there. Yeah, but, you know. Dennis does not like heights. Neither yeah. do I. Chris um, doesn't either. We, I will say there, there's no picture of this, but um, the fire alarm batteries, when they have to be replaced in the visitor uh -huh. center, we have to pull uh -huh. out the really, really big ladder. Yeah. And then none of us are tall enough. I mean, you could just walk up it and be like, boop. I have to get on the very like top, top part and yeah. finagle That's around. And one time, Dennis is terrified of heights. I'm terrified of heights. So I'm like dripping sweat. <laughs> I'm nervous and he's holding the ladder and I'm shaking as I'm trying to change the battery and the whole ladder is like rattling and Dennis yeah. is like are you okay are you okay are you okay and I'm like it's gonna be fine it's gonna be fine and I like do it and then so yeah it's yeah. um <laughs> I, I will say that may have been part of my motivation to retire because I knew those batteries were getting old <laughs> oh yeah I got one more story oh yeah talking about conservators being at the site. Uh -huh. uh, this was when Chris was still working at Vance. And Julie Thomas was our conservator at that time, our uh, so curator. And so she was uh, uh, relabeling everything in the visitor center and at the house. She was going through and uh, uh, reassessing them and stuff. And mm -hmm. She had taken uh, the box that Zeb Vance had with the ink and the light box in it. The light box has little matches in it. <laughs> and she numbered them individually. <laughs> but anyway, she had those there at the old sales desk. And she had them spread out so that, you know, the ink was drying on them. And Chris was came in from mowing or whatever, and he came over there and he reached over and we kept the uh, uh, wooden matches for lighting the fires in the little drawer there. So he opened up the matches you know, opened up the drawer, pulled out the box of the matches there, and he kind of looked around. Julie was over on the other side, kind of doing something, had her back turned to her. And he went and, he went, ch -ch -ch, and lit one of those matches, and he said, Julie, they still work. <laughs> he turned around with a look of horror on her face. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my I don't even... Oh, yeah, man, I wish I had heard this story before I talked to Chris. Yeah, only a curator would appreciate that story. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Wow. <laughs> I've never, I've had people, um, like visitors, do stuff like that. Uh -huh. Or they'll pick up, you know, the Bible in the yeah. sitting room, and it's super yeah. fragile. And they're like, ooh, cool. And they pick it up and, like, flip yeah. pages over, and it's, like, falling apart. I'm like, ah! <laughs> Well, during one of our Christmas events, we had a lady that was like 95 years old, and she decided to sit in the chair in the dance sitting room, in the rocking chair. And Chris Roberts was in the house trying to, and so he went up to her and said, ma'am, you're not supposed to be sitting in that chair. It's an old chair. And she said, well, I'm 95 years old, and I'll do damn well what I want to. <laughs> And the adults come in and they're like, I'm an adult. I can do whatever I want. Exactly. I'm going to touch all these things. I'm yeah, lick when you things. have a school group in, you don't need to watch the kids. You need to watch the teachers and the parents. Right. And I'm really impressed with the direction y'all are taking it in. Because you're telling a story that needs to be told and has been kind of suppressed for so long. And it's, yeah. It's hard, but it needs to be. It needs to be out there, and people need. You know, when we started, in, when I started in '83, the whole Zeb Vance interpretation was more of almost folklorish, in that you talked about all of the funny stories about Zeb, which there's a million of them out there, mm -hmm. but you didn't really talk about the consequences of his actions and his policies, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and I, I think looking at that more so than, you know, the whole whole funny Zeb, you know, being a man of the people kind of thing is it it needs to be it needs to be done. It impacts us today. It does. So um, yeah, it's it's I think that's what it is about that site in particular. Um, it like you said it and it, it touches all of North Carolina history. I mean, it's just. 
um, it's extensive, uh, overwhelming at times, I will say. Yeah. I'm and still, I'm, I've been there four years and I'm still just learning and learning and learning. Yeah. So I knew stuff all the time. So anyway. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. Okay. And um, it was fun. Well, we'll do this again. I okay. like this. Yeah. Thank you, Ducky. <laughs> well, I'll let you get off here then, and uh, we'll talk later once once you can get back to the site. But yeah, anytime you got any questions or anything or just want to chat, let me know. All right. Well, you have a good rest of the day. I will. You too. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.